But right now, we'll just start right now. Okay, you're on. 1.30. Yes. Okay. All right, well, greetings everyone. Again, thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to hopefully keep this session to an hour, get through some, uh, some good information, get you guys thinking and interacting and collaborating. Um, thank you for introducing yourself in the chat. If you're just joining, please go ahead and, and do that. I'm not taking, um, you know, it's not like a sign-in sheet. I'm, I'm just nice to know who's here and what schools are being represented. Um, if you could keep your camera on when possible, that would be great. We understand sometimes that's not possible. And if you're, you know, multitasking, we understand that too. Uh, first thing we want to do is some something fun, just take a couple of minutes, but it's a um, Mentimeter. I don't know if anybody has uh, taken advantage of using this in all our Zoom lives this past year or so, but if you could on another device, a, a tablet, or if you have a, another laptop or desktop or your phone, of course, you can open up uh, your camera and hover over the QR code, or you can just go to menti.com and enter that eight digit code. But we'd like you to answer the question uh, briefly, two to five words. I know that's um, really short, but what are some ideas for home literacy activities for families beyond having students just read aloud? So we'll take a second if you can do that, and then I'll uh, share my screen and we're going to build a word cloud and, and see what everybody's ideas are. I'm going to do it myself. Oops. I'm oh, sorry. QR codes are the easiest. All right. See what kind of ideas you guys are building. The bigger the words get, uh, is the um, amount of times that particular phrase has been used. So we can see that a lot of you have answered writing. Uh, that one's getting bigger. And as you submit, we get new pictures in our word cloud, sight word games. I knew you guys would have all kinds of ideas. Read the room, hmm. write a different ending, a lot of writing, journaling, Acting out. Nice little okay. drama. Some yeah, magnetic letters. Gosh, I used to have more magnetic letters under my fridge than I, I sometimes had them on my fridge, but they eventually made themselves back up there. Reader's theater recipes. That's a, an excellent, um, easy way to have yes, kids involved. Well, well. Yeah. All right, that's slowing down. That's fun. I, I'll uh, follow up with this training uh, with a couple of different things, but uh, I'll definitely send you this, this word cloud and we'll keep it because it's gonna be um, maybe the, the start of a session that we'll have in the fall when we really plan some family engagement activities. So thanks for participating. I love the Mentimeter word clouds. Go back to... PowerPoint and uh, forgot, I asked you guys to introduce yourselves and then I went right into um, the word cloud without introducing myself or my uh, director. My name is Sheila Kane and I'm in the Office of Strategic Partnerships and I'm the District Coordinator for Family and Community Engagement. And our director is Dr. Valerie Brim. Dr. Brim, do you wanna say something? And then you can take it from there. Okay, well, welcome. And thank you. And so we oversee a, quite a few programs, but one of the things that we are very excited about is how we basically guide and lead the district in family engagement events. Um, did I lose? Oh, okay. 
So yes. Here, I'm just trying to change back to the PowerPoint. Sorry. Okay. All right. So we're gonna get started. Um, oh, you. Oh, I'll wait till you. I know it's me. I'm getting there. <laughs> Okay, so today, um, I just want to say thank you, because I know this is a busy time of the year, but I also think it's an opportunity for us to really kind of look at how we're shaping family engagement moving forward, particularly with our reading recovery families. And so one of the, the there are three learning goals at the conclusion of our training that you will have a better understanding. What is, what is authentic family engagement? And, and that is key. And I like the word authentic because in our work, um, particularly when we are trying to apply for grants or we're trying to do surveys, then we all of a sudden want all of our families to get involved. But that's not exactly authentic engagement. So what does that really mean? And why is family engagement essential? And, and you all work with reading recovery and, and the majority of your schools are very challenging schools. And in the research, we talk about, we will not be able to move students in the direction, particularly struggling students without partnering with our families. So we're gonna talk about those pieces because it's very essential that families are in the equation as an instructional strategy. And what would a family event look like for 21-22? So we wanna kind of set the stage. So as you move forward in planning some of your events, you have some background information that we're hopeful that will be, um, that you can apply to your event. So the thing, um, so more recently what we did was we created um, a vision statement. And our vision statement for family engagement is Pinellas County School is a place where rich partnerships among educators, families, and community members promote 100% student success. We're excited about this vision statement because in that vision statement is driven by partnerships. And when we talk about rich partnerships, it requires effort. And we're gonna talk about how we build those um, relationships that will build those authentic relations, uh, partnerships, not only with our families, but with other educators and with our community members. The other thing is our core values. All cultures, ethnicities, our family structures, languages, religions are welcome in our school. We want everybody to be welcome and have an equitable education for their children. Partnerships between schools and families are essential for student learning, growth, and success. Building relationships between district, school, staff, families are vital for school success. And then of course, the collaboration. And so how did this all come about? So I'm gonna try to talk about some background information we started a um, district family engagement team and the entire purpose of starting a district engagement team is that we wanted to identify key departments that deal with family engagement, key department members, so that we can begin to look at engagement from an organizational level. How do we systematize our processes and procedures? When we're talking about organizational leadership, this, are, are we all on the same page as it relates to family engagement? When we talk about development and integrated services, what does our professional development look like? And then when we drill down to where the real work takes place at our schools, do they understand that we are on board, we are invested, and our families count? And so when we began to flush all of this out, we met with Kevin Hendricks and his team. And that is where he thought that we can build the organizational leadership, we can set up systems, but when we get down to the actual school level, 
what does that look like? How does that work? Um, how do we take what we learn and then expand it across our district? And so he suggested reading recovery um, schools. And so that is how we're, we're working now with you all. So we met with Holly, we met with the lead teachers, and now we're working with you all to say, how do we take all of this information that we're building and make it applicable to our schools to build those authentic relationships, authentic engagement, but just not for first grade. How does this expand and how does that parent now has capacity for other siblings or as that first grader move toward um, their goal of graduating from high school? So we are ex very, very excited about this work. So that explains a little bit about how we got here today, right? Where where we started and why you're here and you know why why we're hoping to use your experience and the relationships you can build, the history you have with your families, and, and not only, of course, assist and, and kind of round out the outcome, right? If we include families, then we're going to build towards student success but also we're gonna gain valuable information. The district team will gain the valuable information from this pilot program, basically. I'm trying to, to get a, a snapshot of what we're saying we think works. How does it really work? And that's where you guys come in. Uh, I did send as a, an attachment to the Friday reminder about this meeting, um, a one pager that really reviewed the, the program, the ideas that we had, and that's basically just for for your reference. We don't want to we don't want to keep you you know in a in a cave um, basically where you know you're part of a, a bigger um, a bigger why. And it's helpful to me you know when I'm involved in things like that to understand the the bigger piece. So if you ever have any questions about what else is happening, uh, what else we're doing at the district team level, we're always available to answer those questions. Me and my clicker are too quick. Okay, so the one thing we want to reiterate, and I, I love this quote, we tend to use it um, in, in our engagement workshops, just to make sure that nobody is missing that the acknowledgement that impact comes with strong instruction coupled with partnerships with families. So, you know, only when, as it says, high quality classroom instruction is combined with support for learning at home you know, can all students reach their full potential? Nobody's um, saying one is more important than the other, but it, it's where the partnership comes in that creates the impact. And so where do we start? We uh, reference a, an article here, and it's, it's something that have um, uh, opened some eyes uh, along the way. There was a um, Lessons from 71 Title I Schools article talking about student performance in math and reading improving at a, a much higher rate when teachers did three things. So what are those three things? Three-step recipe for student success. Teachers made a positive personal connection with every family, first and foremost. Teachers helped families understand how well their child was performing, really helping them understand, not just um, you know, sharing data, but, but sharing for understanding, allowing questions and, and a greater um, understanding, teachers providing resources and teaching families, teaching them how to use them. Again, we have in the past at times thrown resources out, made them available, but never given families a chance to feel confident in using those resources. We never gave them a chance to practice them or to get feedback on, on how they were using them. So the, um, the additional effort of how well their student is performing and the practice time is, is essential. So we'll spend a little bit of time on each of these uh, separately. So it's all about relationships. We talk about it all the time. Uh, I know Marissa in, in talking to Dr. Brim and I made that a, a very important piece of what we wanted to focus on today was building relationships and, and helping you all feel confident in, in how to do that. We're gonna do some role plays. We're gonna have some fun later. Uh, but beginning with a welcoming call, 
continuing with um, good news emails, texts, postcards, you know, regularly sending a piece of good news to each family in their preferred method. And then even virtual home visits. Home visits um, prior to COVID were a, a, a big thing. They're still a big thing, but um, until we get comfortable going back in, in homes, uh, we've learned a lot using Zoom this past year. And I, I think both our families and our, our staff have gotten, we've all gotten a, a greater sense of comfort with using these virtual tools. And so it, it's opened up a lot of opportunities to visit with families more than just in a phone call, even if it's a, a virtual home visit, um, putting a, a face to face kind of conversation together um, just means a little bit more. The second, helping families understand how well their child is performing. So really thinking about families should be able to answer these questions. What are the three most important things my child should know and be able to do in reading and math by the end of the year? Now I know in, in your context, it's, it's reading and specifically with the reading recovery program, but um, in overall sense, this is what we tell our, our instructional staff. And then they need to help them understand how well the child is doing on those three important things. Families' perceptions are generally that their students are performing higher than they really are. When they have that real data, they then feel more compelled or, or inspired you know, to take action at home or, or to be supportive of additional efforts. Uh, the phrase at, above, or below grade level is, is something we use all the time. Families want to understand and should understand, is their student performing at, above, or below grade level? And the third step, providing resources and teaching families how to use them. So using student data, um, Marissa, I think, was the one who just said you guys have finished your data meetings or data chats. And so, you know, you have the data, sharing the data with families and helping them understand um, what's happening with their student can often drive the interaction too, right? If you're thinking about what can these families be doing at home? Well, obviously, you know, let's look at where does the student need improvement? Start there. And, and one student to the next, of course, may have some differences. So letting the, the data drive the interaction is important. Then providing those resources, activities, strategies, lessons. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get through the, the hour today. As I said before, having a, a chance for families to practice the strategies, really practice them. N not, again, just you know sharing information, but then here you go, let's, let's pair up and, and let's practice what we're asking you to do at home. Again, so they feel confident to use it. And then sometimes at this point, you'll see a, a, some parent leaders bubble up and they'll be your resource uh, and, and really something you can rely on as I know families come in and out of the, the reading recovery program. You know, Dr. Brim alluded to, we're gonna use what we've learned with this program and, and of course, continue it in the schools at other grade levels and beyond uh, in the classrooms. So it's a, an interesting time to be able to empower parents to honor what they, um, you know, bringing to the table and what you learn about them. And then, you know, you see them uh, become leaders and it, it just serves to improve the situation overall. This is a, a clip, it's a long uh, video and I'm not gonna play the whole thing. I will send you the link and I do hope that you spend, it's 12 minutes uh, in its entirety. We're gonna watch a, a couple of small clips today, but I will send you the link. And I, as I said, I do hope that you have a, a minute to watch it or 12 minutes actually, <laughs> to watch it in its entirety. You may have heard the, of academic parent teacher teams or APTT this is a, an amazing program going well beyond what, what we're really asking you to do with your reading recovery families. But I think it's gonna give you a, an eye-opening uh, peek at you know, what can be done when you really work with families as partners. Let me just find where I'm starting here.
so we had a lot of success with APCC1, right? Oh, Can you hear it? Yes. A lot of students in with sight work and multiplication tests, we went from like around 50% to like over 90%, right? And we couldn't have done that if you guys weren't like playing multiplication war, like making them write down their sight words every night. Like we couldn't have made that happen. If you put at the table, just answer these three questions for me. What strategies do you use at home to make sure that your children are mastering the skill that you would like to that you would like? Right? And just like last time when you came to the first APTT, we read all the charts and we take your considerations into account. So if you could just also let us know what are some skills that you notice that your child is struggling with, because we take you to read them, right? And it helps us with our stuff. Which uh, takes more money? Sounds like a good strategy. Thank you. So really quickly, we're just going to ask, and you can just if you feel comfortable sharing with some some of the things that your group said. If you were just going to pop point out, yes. Oh, that's hard to get. How many other people did that? So that's a good best practice, right? To study, study the words over and over. Does anybody else have something else that they want to add that they thought was really good? Because I see a lot of things written on the kids. Right, the multiple songs. Yeah. How many people are tired of trying to hear your kids? That we celebrated our successes, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of why we're here. So the goals of the meeting by the end of tonight. Um, you should be able to name the most critical reading and math skills that your child should know for the fourth grade. Explain your child's current progress reading skills. Set a SMART goal for literacy and math to work on for the next 60 days. Practice the activities that will help your child meet those goals. Okay, so that's just a, a, a little peek. We're going to watch another quick two minutes. Take into consideration that this is the she had one of the teachers there said, this is the second time they were meeting. Um, so this, this group has had a little bit of time to gel, but um, I think you can feel some of the energy, both from the teachers and, and even the family. Okay, we're gonna move on to the actual activity. And the activity is actually the assessment that I use to assess the students. And it's called Dibbles. Um, so I'm going to show you guys how to do it, then we're going to do one together, and then you guys are going to practice with each other. So let me explain to you how, how Dibbles works. The student gets a copy, I have a copy. Um, when the child says the first word, I start the timer. The timer is one minute, and I'm giving, everybody will be taking home a um, standard timer, which is one minute. They read, as they read, if there's a miscue, they say a word wrong, or they just admit the whole word, and I just check it or I circle it. Something that indicates that lets me know they missed that word. When the timer goes up at the end of the minute, I stop and I mark off the last word they stopped at. Then I will count all the words, and then I'll subtract how many they got wrong. So that final number you get is the number they read correctly per minute. So they're going to practice the same text. You're going to practice the same skill the entire week. But you have colored pencils in your um, folder. You're going to use a different colored pencil to mark the miscues each day. So if I use a red pencil today, tomorrow I'll use a yellow. As I read along, I didn't know it was a mistake or not because I'm not used to them reading to me what they usually read and explain it to me. Okay. So on this question here, as far as asking questions, they all kind of like combined because you have terms similar to me that you know they are word, words that they can't pronounce themselves. In your folder, there are enough sheets for 12 weeks. So if there's a word you may think that's um, pronounced one way, but your child is saying it another way, give me a call. I know most of you have my number. Mark that spot, and I'll call you. Don't feel embarrassed. It's not a problem. Now you're going to be a student. Somebody's going to be a parent, and then we're going to switch. We're going to practice like that. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. A uh, couple things that... I love about this clip or this particular part of, of this video is the the transparency of that that father. I don't know if it's a father or a grandpa, but 
he, he was basically, you know, free, feeling free and confident enough to say, uh, there are sometimes I don't know the word. And, and how awesome that he felt comfortable to say that and was able to, to have the teacher say, call me, you know, don't be embarrassed. Um, it, it's all about the kids. It's, it's about moving the kids forward. And uh, so don't get also don't, uh, and this clip is a little old, so I don't know whether you guys are, are using dibbles or not. I, I'm not, you know, a reading teacher, so don't get caught up in that. The idea is just the, the exercise or the activity and the, the parents being able to have the opportunity to, to really understand what is happening in the classroom and how can I practice the same little activity at home uh, with, with confidence and, and understanding. So Dr. Brim, did you have anything you wanted to say about the video? No, that's it. I'll just tie it into my role play when we start talking about. Um, okay. Next slide. All right. Okay, so we're, we're gonna do um, two activities regarding um, a welcome call home. And I wanna just kind of talk about those pieces prior to us role playing this out. Um, I know that you probably in your initial discussion with the parent that their child is in the read and recovery program because it is a deficiency in reading. And in the program, that we're hoping at the conclusion we see movement. But just from our experience, a lot of our families either receive calls about what their kids are not doing, how they are behaving, but nothing always positive. And, and you probably already do this, but we thought it was just so important to talk about that first initial call a rapport building. And because I work a lot um, with African-American families and sometimes they could be a little tough, they get that rigid and get that tough because all they hear is my kid is misbehaving, all my kid is misbehaving. And sometimes from that, we generate, okay, the only way we get around that where we they accept that we have a vested interest in moving their child is building that relationship. And so we always encourage all teachers, anyone reaching out to their families for the first time, don't let it be about um, the deficiency of the child. Don't be more than five minutes. Because, you know, we have microwavable parents. That's what I call Jimmy on the spot, always moving. So five minutes, introduce yourself, be sincere, communicate your intent in helping their child. You can even express how excited you are about helping them. Underscore the importance of the child reading. And oftentimes we might say there, uh, we want them to move to the next level. So once they move to second grade, they're at a better position than they are now. Clarify with a family, how do you want to be contacted? Via email, via text? Do you want us to um, you know, do a virtual meeting every once in a while? How, what is it that you want and how you want to communicate? And set frequent follow-ups so that they're getting exciting calls about the student moved two levels up, that you, he started out with a lack of fluency. Now he's you know, doing awesome. His comprehension is increased. The frequency of just following up of where the child might be and establish again their preference. The more you put it back on to the family to say, you set the stage, then the conversation will always um, go in a more positive direction. So we're gonna role play. I'm going to be um, the read and recovery teacher and Mrs. Kane is going to be um, the parent. And so we're just gonna role play how we 
would expect just a phone call, a welcoming phone call. And then afterwards, we'll ask you some questions. You give us some insight. You can say, well, that just doesn't work, you know, or how can we tweak that? Be very honest. This is very interactive and engaging. Okay, so are we ready, Mrs. King? I'm ready. Good afternoon, Mrs. King. How are you? I'm fine. Who is this, please? Well, I'm calling you because my name is Valerie Bram, and I have the privilege of working with your son, Ryan. Ryan is a kind blessing to me. And my role with Ryan is that I am going to help him with reading. We noticed that there was some shortfalls, but we want to work together um, to make sure that at the conclusion of his first grade year, he's doing exceptionally well. Um, but Ms. Kane, I can't do it without you. I want to be, I want us to become partners. Our partners, I want Ryan to understand that you and I are on the same page, that we're having the same uh, mindset of moving him to excellence. And I just wanted to call you to introduce myself. You are here for me um, quite often, and I'll just be bringing updates on how excited uh, we are about his performance, but more so than that, just get your insight so we can help your son a lot more this year in first grade. Are there any questions you have for me, Ms. Kane? I, I didn't realize, I, I didn't know Ryan had a shortfall. And is this some program? I, I didn't get any information. Oh, I am sorry if you didn't get our letter. Um, that could be our error. But once we received the data from kindergarten, we noticed that there with some short for air, short, shortfall areas in the reading. And reading recovery initiative, it actually gives Ryan an opportunity to work individually with the teacher so that he has that quiet private time. And so um, that we can work on the areas that are needed. And so we just want, I just wanted to call to make sure you connect a name um, to when Ryan comes home and say, I had a great time with Ms. Brim, you'll say, well, I met Ms. Brim. And so we can continue our relationship throughout um, his, um, his involvement in reading recovery. And well, I, I guess now that you say that, I, I, I have seen some, um, yeah, some areas that he, he might need some improvement in. Uh, we read at home, not, not as frequently as I'd probably like, or he'd probably like, but okay. Well, um, I appreciate your calling. Okay. When, when did you say you'd call back? You said you'd be in touch. I probably with will. Be, I'm going to try to keep in touch with you biweekly, but I also want to just let you know, because we'll call you with a little bit more details. When Ryan comes home excited about reading with you, please listen to him because he's so excited. He talks about coming home to read to you. But you have a wonderful afternoon, and we thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was an example. So we wanted to get just, you know, take about two, to, about two minutes to get your feedback, to say you guys are so off. That's not how it works, um, our families. And then we will talk about strategies. So it is a welcome call. So can we get some feedback about this particular um, phone call and the cheat sheet that um, you might will use when you make that welcome call? And it, it is it can be used across the board for all families. Any feedback? Feel free to unmute and talk, or or you can put your um, you know feedback in the chat. Any any thoughts or reflections? I felt like it was to the fact that the parent was like, oh, I wasn't aware that there was any like problems or whatever, because I feel like even if they were aware and they were told, sometimes they just act like that at the beginning until they realize who you are and that you're there to help. So I felt like that that was a good way to like shift 
you know, from when they're a little defensive to like letting them know that you're there to help to be a team and that kind of thing. Right. Okay. I think that's great too. But sometimes even if they get correspondences, they don't read them or if they read them, they don't quite understand. So that might be um, a great segue to say there was a correspondence that was sent out to make you aware of the reading recovery. Do you recall? And she would say, no, no. And you know, so sometimes we could bounce from that piece. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, they don't um, get the information or they don't understand when they do get it. So the other piece that is very important is that when we do talk with them, even though we might have a, a perception that the parent don't know. We want to always set the stage that they're in the know or they have the capacity to be in the know or they're, we are willing to help build the capacity. So I think those are some key pieces as well. Um, we, we have some comments in the chat. Okay. Um, Got a positive comment out as soon as possible to set parents at ease. Mm -hmm. Super positive. Love the partnership talk. Uh, I like to talk about how reading recovery is a gift. Oh, lovely. Um, oh, that's great. Your child, right? That child was chosen for the program. If you talk about shortfalls, parent can get, parents can get defensive. That, that's even even better way of turning it around on a, a positive, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. Or even elaborating on an opportunity for like quiet private time with their own teacher that no one else in the classroom has, you know, those types of pieces that, you know, you can make a positive slam. Okay. That she tries to make contact before sending, sending information home. That's, yes. that's, so then you can alert to, you know, more details are coming, check the backpack or whatever way you're using to, to communicate. So that's another, um, that's another good suggestion. Dr. Brim, can I add something in? This is Marissa Coda. Absolutely, Marissa. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, what I noticed, and I think our teachers think a lot about their language and that your language was uh, very accepting and it was very um, growth or growth forward. Like um, it's a blessing. Uh, this is my role. I can't wait to work with him. Um, I didn't realize you didn't know when, um, so all of it was an ex accepting anything the parent said and then turning it to say what you need them to know. Um, so I just wanna say that to teachers that, that that language that was back and forth is what kept it positive sometimes. And that um, the accepting the approximation, just like we talk about with our students, when we accept their approximations um, and say, oh, well, okay. And instead of getting defensive ourselves that um, we go a little farther with that. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. And I wanna be back on that. The timing is everything. So when you think about you have uh, so like in, in initially in the beginning of the school year, you have all of these things to do. And you think about that at the school, I was given 15 to 20 kids. I'm just making anything up. And I have to make 15 to 20 calls, but take the time when you're ready so that it ends up positive. Even if there's a negative comment, you're ready to respond in a positive manner. And that takes work. I, I always say, and I always tell um, the staff, sometimes I carry a, carry a loaded gun, like a, say something slick. You know, you, <laughs> you really do, you know, because you, you, you deal with so much. And so I always have to say, Valerie, put the loaded gun down and respond and how you want to be responded to. And so I think that's that's how we have to really look at parents, particularly when we think about their load and where they're coming from. And so my next uh, role play is that this is a call where there is an issue. So Mrs. King will be calling me and I think I'm gonna have a loaded gun. No, I'm just- <laughs> Thanks for the warning. All right, we're gonna do one more and then 
just to, to tease it out there, uh, we're going to ask for you guys, for two volunteers. We'll just do one, uh, but it'll be your turn. So be thinking about what you might want to uh, be talking about or if, if one of you feels compelled to volunteer. So anyway, all right, here I am. Ring, ring. Phones ring anymore? Hello. Hi, hi, um, Mrs. Smith. This is Sheila Kane from Pinellas County Schools. Uh, I'm, I'm calling to talk to you uh, about Kimmy for a second. Uh, do, you, do you have a minute? This is the fifth call. What, what has he done now? Could you please tell me? Really, uh, nothing. At, at, now you're throwing me. No. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I'll be good. I'll be good. Really? <laughs> we didn't practice that. Anyway, I'm so no. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you've gotten repeated phone calls. Um, I, I am calling just to talk a little bit about some behavior, but uh, gosh, you know, we're, we're trying so hard. Kimmy has been great uh, in, in so many ways. We've had her involved in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, initially, the one-on-one -on -one groups in reading recovery. Then we have moved her to um, the group interventions. She's been very, very um, positive. I've seen a lot of progress. But recently, recently, she's just been a little antsy. I don't know. I, I feel like she's not focused. It, it, it's been an issue. And I was, I was calling to see if actually you might have some suggestions. If, if you're seeing some of the same behavior at home, um, maybe what works for you, maybe you can help me with, with some strategies because gosh, I, I just want her to keep continuing to progress. What, what are you thinking? Well, I, I have noticed that um, she's been a little more difficult at home, but Kimmy, when she is in that mode of being somewhat disrespectful, um, not following through, what I would like you to do is, is remind her that we're on the same team. Remind her, and you have permission to call me during those times. And we conversate together with, with Kimmy. So I remind her that I want her to respond to you like she responds to me at home. And so that is one strategy that, that I think, one strategy, I'm sorry, that we could use is that we get on the phone together with Kimmy and resolve it right where it takes place. And then when she's home, I could kind of reiterate some of the positive behavior expectation. Um, but I, I really don't know what could be the problem, but I will talk with her when she comes home today. Okay. I was, I was thinking too, maybe, maybe I'll ask her to sit next to me. Um, maybe even in, make her, I don't know. Well, I wouldn't her. do that. I wouldn't do that. Because, no? no, because then she would be singled out and she feel isolated unless you pull her for a leadership role to, okay. to her behavior. But if you sit her next, it, it might aggravate the behavior. <laughs> okay, would, well, that's good to know. That's okay. good to know. Well, I, I, I appreciated our first phone call uh, a couple of months ago, and I, I knew I was comfortable to call you and ask for your help today. I, I did want to loop you into what was happening because I think it's important that you, you know, uh, especially when I, I feel like it might be impeding her progress a little. So I really appreciate your input, and uh, I, I hope I don't have to call you, but I, I will keep your number handy, and if she starts to get that antsy uh, acting up behavior again, we'll we'll be giving you a buzz. That number so that you, you gave me at the beginning of the year, that's still good? Yes, and you can. You don't have to wait a month. You could call me like every other week so that she sees we constantly speak. Okay, All well, right. I appreciate that so much. Okay, have a good afternoon. You. you too, bye-bye. So okay. there were some comments in the chat and I wasn't sure. Um, as we were role playing. Um, oh, um, the new oh, one. Oh, that's great. She's, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. King, and do the no, I, It's okay. Informal contact at pickup. That's, that's a good, um, that a good is idea. a great idea. Yeah, face-to-face mm -hmm. -face can be better, uh, for sure. 
Marissa, I don't know what that means. How do you do that, Sharon? Where, where, when, what do you say? Oh, I'm just encouraging oh. Sharon to tell oh, others because we have some, um, some people that are excellent at parent communication um, in our group. I won't call them out right now <laughs> for the same reason that maybe you wouldn't <laughs> um, pull a, a, a sensitive child closer to you, but we have some people that are, are very good at it and it does make a difference in um, what they achieve with those students. So I was just encouraging some people that have got some things under their belt to write it in the chat so that maybe others take it away, that's it. Well, maybe they'll, maybe they'll be one of the ones to volunteer. I'm hoping uh, so. <laughs> so a couple things, you know, we tried to do in that was to reference the first call, you know, where we were just calling about, you know, building, a, starting to build a relationship, um, trying to put the issue in a positive light, um, getting input and tag teaming. Um, I forgot to mention uh, upcoming events. So I, I could have said, hey, look out for um, something coming up in the next, you know, few weeks, we're going to have a, a family engagement session, ask them for your help with some additional activities at home, just to, you know, use the opportunity while you're talking to them to get that in and, and get that on their radar. And, and one of the strategies, you know how when we were in college, and we would seek out others to find out how was the professor that we was trying to take a class, and how were the exams? You could do that same type of thing with the kindergarten teacher. Kind of say, you know, was the how was the parent? Was she workable? Um, you know, was she difficult to deal with? So you get somehow some idea of the parent you're calling so you can, you know, be intentional about setting the stage because you have some background, you know, and so that, that might help a lot. Okay, Thank so you. I'm excited about watching. All right, there may or may not be a little, you know, something prize-wise for those of you who would volunteer. Yes. So if you are interested. Um, I'm not this. interested, but I have. <laughs> yes. But I, can you go back one slide? Because I was writing some stuff down and right. I didn't catch the end. But I'm not volunteering, so I just needed that, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll be. I'll send you the um, the PowerPoint uh, slides so that you can have them for reference if if there's anything you want to. You know, no maybe. volunteer, Marissa. Do you have anyone that you would like to volunteer? <laughs> okay, go ahead and tell them. We're gonna provide you. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I think those people already know who I say you're so good at parent communication because I've said it to your face. So, um, and you can pick the topic if you want to just do a welcoming call or you want it to be an issue or. I will private message else. to say something right now. So you can get Chick-fil-A two Chick-fil-A coupons for dinner. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Good kids. <laughs> All right, let's see. They check your chat, because I'm- It's okay. I mean, it, it, we don't need to twist arms. It's okay, we can move along. We have plenty left to do. So if you, uh, it's up to you, Marissa. Okay. Well, they're good at this. They know they're supposed to too. Come on, guys. Sorry. Hello? Hi. Yay. Hi. Yay. Hi. Um, are we supposed to be pretending or to make a phone um, call you, for somebody? Yeah, you can yes. do it either way you want, but we need to, if you want to be the teacher, we need somebody to volunteer to be the, the parent. Um, so we need two. You and you can be, you know, you can be ornery or you can be you know, sweet as pie, it's up to you. Okay, so okay. I'll be the parent and you call me. Pretend right. you're Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, phone is ringing. Hello. Hello, how are you? May I please speak to Mrs. Brim? This is she. Hi, my name is Tarsha Hagen. I am calling from Bear Creek Elementary School and I have some exciting news for you. Your child has been selected to be a part of a wonderful program 
almost like they get a tutor one-on-one. -on -one. So we were able to assess a lot of the first graders and your child was personally selected because we feel that they can benefit a lot from this program. It will help them with their reading, with their alphabet knowledge, with their fluency, anything that they need that they have a deficit in or issues with, this program is here for them. But we're gonna need your help. Are you okay with your child participating with this program? Um, I, just let me ask um, a quick question. What was the criteria for being selected? That criteria is at the beginning of the school year, all of the children are uh, analyzed or assessed based on um, their abilities with reading and some students um, are selected because we feel that they can benefit and increase their initial scores. So with, with our help, your child will either remain on grade level or excel beyond grade level by the end of this program with your support. Oh, this sounds great. I, I noticed he does have a little difficulty coming from kindergarten. So if this is a program that's gonna help him, I'm, I'm all in. Oh, absolutely. I've actually had a chance to meet with him and he has been amazing. He knows um, almost all of his letters. He knows almost all of his letter sounds and he even knows a couple of sight words. So whatever you guys are doing, keep it up. Well, whatever. thank you it, very you much. You are so welcome and I really appreciate your support. I appreciate you calling me and if you need me for anything, just give me a call. Absolutely. And the and phone I'll that I'm calling- I'll send you my work, my work schedule. So you will know when I'm available as far as my work schedule. And you could call me on this number anytime. Absolutely. And this is also my personal cell phone number. So if there's any issues, you can call me as well. Um, I'll have you stored in. Also, if you can uh, send me a quick message uh, with your email, we're actually going to put together a Zoom where in case you can't make it to come out, we're going to explain in detail exactly what the program is, what your child would be doing at school, and exactly what's going to be coming home and how you can help your child at home. So it's like a partnership. Oh, great. All right. Well, thank you so much for calling. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, you did a great job. Yeah, that was excellent. We're going to recruit you for our next training. <laughs> That was a great job. So I have to send you your Chick-fil-A cards. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get them to you. I'll, I'll <laughs> be in touch. Um, we had a couple of text or chat messages. I always ask if the parent texts and have a text with them. Easy and efficient, doesn't bother them at work. Pictures, questions, all good. Uh, walking up or car ride or a dismissal, try to catch the parent. Um, and just say they're one of the first grade teachers, excited to have that opportunity. Nice. That's you guys are, yeah, you're, you're doing it already. Awesome. All right, so I, I, I know we're bumping up onto an hour. We're probably gonna go a few minutes over, not much, um, but I want to, maybe Dr. Brim, I'll send the, the second the video. little video. Yes. All right, yes. we'll send that one too. We'll, we'll ask you to, uh, to watch both. We thought we might stop here and, and just get some you know, questions out or a discussion, but I, I feel like we've had a, a pretty good discussion and in the interest of time, um, let's move along. If that's okay, Dr. Brim, what do you think? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. we can move to the pre-planning, yes. All right, so the, the next part of the, the training is to just kind of whet your appetite for what's going to come in the fall. Um, I'm gonna go over some process conditions, they're called. It's reviewing what effective family capacity building sessions should look like. Uh, what conditions are necessary for adult learners to really uh, make the session successful. So this idea for this part of the, the session came from a, a meeting that Dr. Brim and I had with Marissa. So I'm gonna hand it over to Marissa for a second so she can kind of lay the groundwork. Well, I have to, I think I'm, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, so we just know that if, if we see a difference in your data, if children, uh, if you have a relationship with the parent and we see a difference in your data because there's extra practice and Mary Freed tells you all the time, 
some of this work has to go home. So the, the sight word practice. So if you're thinking ever, he can't remember, or um, he's just not learning words. Well, those are, those are times where you have to recruit the parents. So we want to think collaboratively and build collabor collaboratively resources for you to do that like resources for welcome letters that fit Pinellas, resources for videos that um, you can send or, or send home with the child on how to do a cut up. Uh, so we have some of them, but we, we need to kind of build together all the different kinds of things we do, um, like learning a word or um, those the, the site where games that they can play at home, like memory or go fish or, um, you know, any of any of those kinds of things that we play, we want real videos of how to play with students because you know that in our classroom, when we role play when it goes wrong, you learn the most. So um, the parents are the same, right? So what do I do when my child um, doesn't know the word? Because often what we get is a lot of assessing on sight words and they don't know them, right? So helping a, a parent understand if they don't know the word, tell them the word, have them write the word on the table and then put it back in the pile for tomorrow, right? So we want to, to help parents understand it's not always assessing. We have to help them build that knowledge as well. So what we're looking for from you is how can we do this collaboratively so that everybody's not doing all the work um, and we can build resources to put it together. Like um, we might create a team that can build a PowerPoint for um, a, a welcome session to reading recovery for each round. We could um, like uh, on a Zoom call or things like that so that we work because that's what we do best, work collaboratively. Um, so we want you to kind of get ready and think about those things. Is that good? Nice segue, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're just going to touch on uh, there's six process conditions and just, you know, as I said, get your, your wheels going with how would this play out in, in a session that we will, we will be planning with you. We, we are here to support you. Dr. Brim and I aren't going to go away. Uh, we will meet again in the fall or, you know, late summer and help you plan these sessions. We will host them. We'll, we'll do whatever you need us to do uh, to make it as easy as possible to deliver the information, you guys, and, you know, for the parents to um, be there and, and receive the information, so. Nash, as Ms. Kane began to talk about the process condition, go back to when we talked about learning goals, what is authentic engagement? These process condi conditions will actually yield authentic engagement. So think about those pieces as we roll through them. We've talked about relationships before. Uh, it's not a mistake that the first condition is relational. The major focus of um, initiatives and, and programs should be on building trusting and respectful relationships between home and school. And this means intentional activities that help build a positive relationship. Really no meaningful family engagement can take place until that relationship is established. And this is especially important um, with situations where families have had a, a history of mistrust or some negativity with, with their schooling or in, in somehow in the past. So, um, you know, mailing, robocalls, incentives, they, they don't ensure participation like a personal invitation from a, a trusted individual. So when you start to think about how you're gonna promote a session, um, you know, making it a, a personal invitation and, and beginning that, you know, opening of the, the relationship building. The next condition is that it be linked to learning. And certainly um, in this scenario and in, in this program, it, it's all about being linked to learning. But sometimes in, when we talk about family engagement activities or parent involvement, there, there are fun activities and we don't always use the opportunity to build the parent's capacity. Fun activities are, are important because that goes back to helping the relationship uh, be built, but always taking the opportunity to, to link it to learning. Um, again, intentional activities that help families, as we said before, learn about how their child is doing, what they're supposed to know, um, connecting families to teaching and learning goals, and you know, understanding that they'll be motivated to participate, um, not only in the evening activities at home, but in the actual you know, activity that you're bringing them in to, to teach them activities, um, you know, if they understand that this is gonna help their student. Dr. Brim? 
Okay, and so the, the next one is accent um, based. You know, oftentimes um, a lot of our programs is built on a, a deficit component. But what we want to do is have, take an opportunity to learn the weaknesses, the shortcomings, the deficiencies. And then how do we approach the families knowing those pieces so that we speak from a voice of strengthening the parents, building their, um, building their capacity, but also finding out what they possess. And that's, that's huge. No one wants to come to the table feeling like they're, they're dumb or they're stupid or something to that, to that. So you want to set that stage. You want to build activities where you honor and you value the families that you're focusing on also not only their honor, but actually building what they need to move their kids. And you're shifting the power from the school, from the teacher to the parent. And so that power is going to last a lot longer when we know that um, it's, it's like transferring learning. You're transferring learning to the parent for them to take over. So you wanna empower and partner and what does building literacy look like coming from that family's home? and take all of those pieces in consideration. So that's huge. The next one is um, culturally, res oh, yeah, culturally responsible, I'm saying responsiveness and respectful. So this is, this is a harder piece because it's going to require that you really do some background work or you really do some studying. And you know how you do that? By listening and fellowshipping with that first grade kid. You can hear, because kids coming from home speak the home language. When they get into the former environment, we alter that by correcting them, teaching them a more formal language. But listen to that student. Asking those students questions, you find out the value, the honor, the respect, you find out about the parent. So when you do communicate, you're culturally aware that you know um, how to communicate with that family. So for an example, um, I oftentimes, again, sometimes I work with Hispanic families, I work with um, African-American families, and I have to code switch. And so I always tell individuals I'm bilingual. I could speak Ebonics or what I call a hood language when I need to. And then I could change and switch to a formal language. But to the ability to go code switch when you're speaking to parents is, is actually a plus. Not that you're dummying down, but you have the ability to communicate more effectively. And so when, so for an example, and I'm going to use an example of uh, vocabulary. If you are teaching students vocabulary, you might say, when you go home, ask your mom, where's the couch? Or then come up with another term for the couch. It might be sofa. Because you don't know what terms that they speak at home that's not going to be on those formal tests. Or you might say, okay, here's some vocabulary. Parents come up with another term to use um, when you are, you know, code switching or when you're trying to understand the family dynamics. Someone put in a chat about singing. Singing is that that is. They talk about this research about motivating students to learn through singing. And I know I'm, a, but that is another means of actually understanding cultural differences. I guess those are some huge pieces. Thank you. Um, and we can elaborate and learn a lot more about those pieces if you need assistance as you move forward in your planning. Okay. Last two, um, collaborative. So 
So it's known learning is best conducted, especially with adults in groups. And shared learning really um, fosters peer learning, right? And, and networking between families and staff, which is a, another opportunity to, to take advantage of. So you're ultimately uh, building the social capital of both families and school staff. This is you know, intentional activities that help build those positive relationships families have with each other. Sometimes, uh, especially in, in districts like ours where, you know, Families can live next door, down the street, or across the county. It, it's, it's just a mix. And so you, you don't often have the, the families getting to know each other in ways that like it used to be. And so they use the school you know, to be that connector. And so taking that opportunity to be that connector really builds that, that networking and that collaborative kind of a, um, environment. And the learning takes place um, almost you know, seamlessly. Also, I think we talked about it before about building parent leaders, and this is where you, you can see some of the, the parent leaders come alive. So the last condition we would suggest that you think about including when we get together in the fall for the family capacity building planning session is that we make it interactive. We've tried to model um, in our approach today all five of those process conditions. Um, we try, it's, it's hard to do all five. It's, it's especially hard to do all five when we're in a, a virtual setting, but we try to make it, make it fun or make it at least touch on all those five process conditions. This part is the adults learn when they practice. So actually just this morning, I had a, a light bulb above my head that we had no interactive session or no interactive piece to our session. So we added, asking you guys to role play. We were role playing, but we weren't asking you guys to role play or to feedback, um, you know, give us input on, on our role plays. So anyway, this covers really the intentional activities where, where you're allowing families to practice and receive feedback. Um, again, you know, giving the information is one thing, but it's really insufficient without the parents being able to test out what you're telling them to do at home and to get feedback. I know we've had a lot of uh, little messages in the chat. Some good things were talked about. Um, I don't know what roaming is. What is roaming, Sharon? It's the first two weeks of our lessons. It's more informal and where we can kind of get to know our kids and we have a little bit more kind of flexibility in what we do. Nice, perfect. During roaming, do you share your background as well? It's always kind of two way. I mean, okay, background experience. Not, yeah, not overshare, but like when we're doing anything, it's kind of like a partnership. So when we're writing and things like that, it's like we're co constructing. So, yeah. Okay. And then it helps us to kind of well to understand where our kids are coming from, like some of their background, but then helps us to select books and guide maybe some of their writing and things like that. So. Okay. Perfect. Um. We have someone sent home a dream box for the parents to build with their kids, place for them to put pictures like a vision board or something, encourage them to keep it in a special place, um, add to it throughout the year. Nice. Their promise pledge. That promise pledge is a, um, is that a reading recovery promise pledge? Or I know it's referencing the LeBron James book, but is that something you've adapted? Um, it's something I adapted from the promise book. At the end of the book, he has a list of all the pledges. Then I have each child choose three of them that mm -hmm. they want to promise to themselves so that they can have a better year, just be a better citizen in general. Um, and then I write it down and then we put it inside the box for them to remember. And I post another copy of it on our board. So it reminds them throughout the year of what they promise to do to be better and I make one too so it's like we we do it together amazing I look forward to it. a lot of the parents when I give them the first call usually give them the first call after I send that home they're like oh the dream lady <laughs> so like kind of put that connection because that's kind of like my little weight in right to family because they they kind of remember like little specialized token things like I know as a parent I always love it when I get photos of my kid so mm -hmm. oh that's awesome
Great ideas. Great ideas. Okay. All right. We're, um, we're at the end. Just a couple of things that we're going to promise uh, from our end. And uh, if you have any reflections or questions or discussion, I will send you out uh, both videos since we didn't get to the second one either. I, I want you to know that we are going to be we alluded to uh, looping in, you know, the school that this is a, a kind of a pilot, you know, microcosm program, but we will be, of course, um, making sure that the first grade teachers and the administrators understand what we're doing with you. We actually met with all the principals um, a couple of months ago, which is when we slowed down the timeline for this year. They were, they were very vocal about that. So we'll remind them what we're doing uh, in the upcoming year, make sure that your uh, partners in the first grade classrooms know what's going on. Um, we'll put together a, a small script. I know you guys are um, capable, but it might help just to, you know, use some of those tips and cheat sheet uh, bullet points with a, a script for some initial calls. And also Dr. Brim and I were talking about um, putting together, sometimes we fall short in the monitoring. So we want to make sure that, of course, in this scenario, we are, it's all about the monitoring. We want to understand what has family engagement added to the mix. And that's, that's where we need to have some data uh, and oomph for our uh, larger learning piece. So we'll, we'll talk about some monitoring tools. Does anybody have any questions? I apologize. We're at 241. Uh, I know you guys are anxious to get on with your afternoon, uh, but we'll, we'll be here for questions or uh, always available. You'll have my email. You have it uh, from the Outlook invitation, but you'll have it from my, my follow-up with the, the files and links that I've promised. Throughout the year, we'll ask you to video a session with your student of some kind of activity that you really enjoy doing with your student so that when we do our training, we can incorporate some of our live, authentic work into some of our trainings as we expand out. And we can also, so much. We can also oh, have ahead. that as something, you know, because we do videos for class and things like that. So as teacher leaders, we'll think about a way so that you, you're not doing extra assignments and things like that. So just know mm -hmm. that it might be part of our class sessions and um, that's, a, that's okay with us too. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you attending. Thank you, Marissa, for your hard work. And I understand the students in Read and Recovery are moving. And that's what I look forward to. Yes. So we are this summer going to work with literacy, ladders to literacy, some of those ones that left the Read and Recovery to kind of connect with some of those families to make sure they have some webinars throughout the summer as well. So thank you very much. And we appreciate your time. Uh, okay, that's all she wrote. <laughs>